Good evening. This is going to be a slightly different sky at night because we're going to deal with something you can't actually see. It's called SS433 and it's in the constellation of Aquila the Eagle. You can recognize Aquila easily enough. The brightest star is Altair, with a fainter star to either side, quite high in the evening sky now. And here is SS433. It's fairly faint, about magnitude 13. I can see it quite easily with my own telescope, but it looks just like a faint star. And there's a negative picture of it, and you can see SS433 as the tiny dot on the end of that arrow. And until 1978, it aroused absolutely no interest whatsoever, because it was taken to be an ordinary star. But it certainly isn't. Occasionally, a star will destroy itself in a tremendous outburst known as a supernova explosion. And supernovae come in two types. With type 1, we have a binary or two-star system. Bearing in mind that a star is a great atomic reactor, in this binary system, the more massive star evolves the more quickly of the two. It turns into a red giant star. It blows off its outer layers. And then what is left is a very small white dwarf star made up of material thousands of times denser than water. But that white dwarf still has a very strong pull, and it pulls material away from its companion. And gradually, material is built up around the white dwarf, until eventually things become unstable. There's a tremendous outburst, and the white dwarf literally blows itself to pieces. So a type 1 supernova involves the total destruction of a white dwarf star. And you may remember that a few months ago, we did a program about a type 1 supernova in a nearby galaxy, Centaurus A. But of more immediate interest to us now are type 2 supernovae. And here we have a massive star, which finally uses up all its nuclear fuel and begins to collapse. The collapse is very sudden and quite catastrophic. There's an implosion, the opposite of an explosion. And once again, we have a tremendous rebound and an outburst. And you're left with a patch of expanding gas and what you can call a stellar remnant or a stellar corpse made up of neutrons, this time millions of times denser than water. And gradually the outer shell dissipates and just vanishes. And plenty of these type II supernova remnants are seen. I suppose the most famous of all supernova remnants is the Crab Nebula, which is a patch of gas in the constellation Taurus the Bull. And we know that that's the remnant of a star which was seen to explode way back in the year 1054 and for a time became bright enough to be seen in broad daylight. And right in the center of the Crab Nebula is a neutron star, which is the Crab's powerhouse. And um, that is spinning around rapidly and sending out pulsed radio waves, which is why we call it a pulsar. Now there's a supernova remnant in Aquila. And in that supernova remnant, there is a point radio source, which does not appear to be a pulsar. And then something else very interesting was found. The British artificial satellite Ariel 5 was carrying out an X-ray survey of the sky when it found an X-ray source in the same area as W50 and the point radio source. All very interesting. A radio source, an X-ray source, and what appeared to be a supernova remnant, all in the same area. So could there be a star or something else which was associated with it? Two British astronomers, David Clark and Paul Murden, decided to find out. And so they took a long, hard look at it with the great Anglo-Australian telescope at Siding Spring in Australia. And they found it, SS-433. But it turned out to be more bizarre than they could have imagined. And who better to tell us about it than David Clark himself? David, welcome to the sky at night. Good evening. First of all, why were you looking so hard at W50? Well, Paul Merton and I had been interested in supernova remnants over many years. We already had radio data on W50, and we were aware of the X-ray detection that you referred to from Ariel 5. So it seemed to us that there was likely to be an interesting star there. Now, our reason for believing that the optical object must be interesting really comes from our knowledge of the electromagnetic spectrum, which, of course, extends from radio waves through the infrared to the optical and out to short wavelengths and X-rays and gamma rays. Now, what we had was an object which was very interesting in X-rays, and X-rays come from very hot gas at millions of degrees. And radio waves all also tend to indicate very energetic conditions. So there was already, from the radio data and the X-ray data, indications of something interesting that might be there at optical wavelengths. Unfortunately, the X-ray data and the positional data from the radio was rather poor, so it took us quite a long time looking with the AAT before we found 
the interesting star that we believe was associated with the radio and X-ray object. How did you realize it was so very unusual? Well, we realized that as soon as we spread out the light from the star into a spectrum, into its different component colors. The first thing that the spectrum showed us was that there were very bright emission lines in the spectrum, which we could associate easily with hydrogen and with helium. Now, in fact, there was no surprise in that, because, of course, hydrogen and helium are the most abundant elements in the universe. But what did surprise us was, in addition, there were features in the spectrum which we could not identify. Now, the true nature of those features actually showed up somewhat later due to observations by American astronomers using the big telescopes in California and a group of Italian astronomers uh, working at the Asiago Observatory. And what these observers found independently was that these peculiar emission bands that Paul and I could not identify drifted backwards and forwards across the spectrum in a rather unusual way. Indeed. Now, I must stress just how unusual this is, because although astronomers are used to stars varying in brightness on time scales from s fractions of a second for the pulsars to hundreds of years for other types of variable star, the spectrum just should not vary in this way. Indeed, one of the American astronomers who made this uh, discovery of the drifting features, Bruce Margan, likened it to driving along a motorway and finding that the exit ramps had moved from day to day. Uh, spectra just should not behave in this unusual way. Indeed, if you look at uh, some spectra that Bruce Margan produced on consecutive nights, you can see the dramatic change night to night as these peculiar features drifted around the spectrum. Do you think this could be due to the famous Doppler effect? Initially, the Doppler effect was rejected as an explanation, and the reason is the following. The Doppler effect you would expect to find for a star that was receding from you that the features in the spectrum were red shifted, whereas when a star is coming towards you, you would expect the features to show a blue shift in the spectrum. What SS433 seemed to be showing was at the same time features which were both red shifted and blue shifted. Indeed, the New York Times ran an article on the peculiar star under the headline, Peculiar Star is Coming and Going at the Same Time. Well, that must have been quite a shock. Nothing like that had ever been seen before. And it's very difficult to imagine a star that is approaching and receding simultaneously. So, um, what's the answer? Well, very rapidly, uh, the theoreticians at the uh, University of Cambridge and a group in Israel came up with a viable model to explain exactly what was going on. And this was based on the idea that at the heart of SS-433, we had a binary system, very similar to the system that you were uh, mm -hmm. talking about earlier when you were talking about type 1 supernovae. Yeah. Except now, the collapsed object, rather than being a white dwarf, was a neutron star. So we had a neutron star and a normal star in orbit, one around the other. And the neutron star, the intense gravitational field of the neutron star, was drawing off material down onto the surface of the neutron star, not directly, but via what's called an accretion disk, much like uh, the water flowing down the plug hole of the bath with the tap at the other end of the bath left running. Yeah. Now, as the material falls down onto the surface of the neutron star, it gets heated to extreme temperatures of millions of degrees, producing intense X radiation. And this X radiation is believed to drive off some of the material, the infalling material, in two finely collimated jets in uh, opposite directions. So here you have the explanation of the coming and going. We are seeing one jet in SS-433 shooting away from us, and one jet coming towards us. But why should the material come out in jets at all? A possible explanation for that is due to the magnetic field around the collapsed object, around the neutron star, forming uh, magnetic nozzles, which tend to direct the material into these finely collimated jets. It must be a very powerful magnetic field. And SS-433 is often nicknamed the, the Cosmic Lawn Sprinkler, which I think is a lovely name, but do you think it's an appropriate one? It is rather appropriate, because it turns out that the jets are not fixed in space, but process around every 164 days, indeed like a giant garden sprinkler. Indeed, this procession of the jets every 164 days is the reason why the mysterious bands in the spectra drift backwards and forwards on a 164-day time scale. 
Um, can we actually see the jets directly? We can't see the jets in optical light, not directly. We can't image them optically. But we can see them, particularly in x-rays and also in radio waves. Uh, this image is an x-ray map taken by a group of astronomers from the University of Leicester um, using the Einstein Observatory, which was in orbit up to a few years ago. And this shows the uh, jets in x-rays burgeoning out into the uh, surrounding supernova remnant W50. I imagine that the velocities at which that material is being expelled are pretty high. Well, this was another interesting feature. The material in the jets is traveling at about a quarter of the velocity of light. Now, I must emphasize how great those velocities are. Indeed, material traveling at the speed of the SS-433 jets would traverse the distance from the Earth to the Moon in a mere five seconds. That is quite some speed. Well, we've been talking about the material coming out of the jets, but does the material come out smoothly in a kind of continuous flow, or does it come out in blobs, if you like? Well, in fact, that's exactly right. It does come out in blobs. If we can talk about the lawn sprinkler analogy again, it is almost as if somebody was jumping up and down on the hose, <laughs> and the material is, in fact, coming out in blobs, or we refer to it as bullets of material. And that can actually be seen? That can certainly be seen very dramatically at uh, radio wavelengths. Um, some recent observations by a group of European astronomers, headed by a team from the Westerbork Observatory in the Netherlands, took this rather dramatic set of radio maps which show at two daily intervals blobs of material being ejected from SS-433 and drifting outwards at this incredible speed out into space. Well, SS-433 is right in the middle of W50, and presumably when this material comes out in jets at this tremendous speed and in blobs, it must have um, a very considerable effect upon W50 itself, I mean the entire supernova remnant. Indeed, that is certainly correct. If one looks at W50, it does not display the nice normal symmetry that one expects for a supernova remnant. Most uh, supernova remnant shells are reasonably spherical. But what you see in W50 are these sort of ears or protrusions on either side, and those ears are in fact produced by the jets of material ejected from SS-433. Well, it's a fascinating object altogether, and um, I think people may be a little puzzled by the name, SS-433. What exactly does that stand for? Well, it actually comes from a catalogue of stars produced by two American astronomers, uh, Bruce Stevenson and Nicholas Sanjuliak. And it turned out that a year before Paul and I started looking for the star with the Anglo-Australian Telescope, Stephen and Sanjuliak had produced a catalogue of stars which seemed to show emission lines. Now, they didn't know about the X-ray source, they didn't know about W50, and they didn't know about the, the point radio source. But they did find this object with the bright optical emission lines, and they put it in a catalogue, and it was number 433 in their catalogue, hence SS-433. You know, the other night, using the modest telescope, my 15-inch reflector, in my own observatory down at Celsius, um, I identified the field of SS-433 and had a look at it, and although it looks merely like a faint star, it's not in the least difficult. Isn't it rather remarkable that this extraordinary nature wasn't discovered long before it actually was? That's a very good point. It is certainly true that one can see it with a relatively modest-sized telescope. And indeed, the spectral features are so bizarre that they could have been detected with the sort of instrumentation that astronomers had available, say, 100 years ago. Such as the Greenwich 26-inch refractor, the one I used to use for moon mapping. That would have done very nicely. The trouble was that astronomers 100 years ago just wouldn't have known quite where to look. Uh, there was no reason to attract them to this peculiar star until we had the power of x-ray astronomy and radio astronomy to reveal its rather unusual properties and to focus us in to look at that particular star. Well, so far, it's the only one, isn't it? That's true. Do you think we're going to find any others? I would hope so, um, although we have been looking for a number of years and we haven't found anything quite like it. Why not, do you think? I think one of the reasons may be the peculiar set of circumstances which enables us to have an object like this. The first thing we need to do is to have a binary star which has survived a supernova explosion. Now, it is our belief that probably 90% of binary stars, where one of the stars explodes as a type 2 supernova, are disrupted in the explosion. And what happens is that although one gets the creation of a neutron star and a binary system, this is flung away from the site of the uh, explosion, much like a stone from a slingshot. 
So only in about 10% of the cases would we expect the binary star to survive the uh, supernova explosion. Another reason is that the SS433 phase of stellar evolution is probably relatively short, perhaps only a few hundred thousand years, a mere blink of the eye in, uh, in cosmic terms. If you're going to find any more of these cosmic lawn sprinklers, where are you going to look? I would imagine that um, a favourable site would be inside supernova remnants. That's absolutely right. Uh, we would certainly expect them to be associated with the expanding debris from supernova explosions and we've certainly been looking near the centres of supernovae. Another thing strikes me. We normally associate jets with things such as quasars and radio galaxies, which are very different from SS-433. So here we have jets of possibly the same kind. Is there any, any similarity, basically, do you think? It may well be that the same sort of physical processes, the same scientific explanations underlie the jets in SS-433 and the jets that we see in quasars and in the radio galaxies. Although I need to stress the difference in scale um, the jets in SS-433, we observed them in X-rays out to distances of uh, a few light years, whereas the jets in the radio galaxies extend out to millions of light years. Um, I mentioned that the jets in SS-433 process around the sky every 164 days, whereas the jets in the radio galaxies probably take millions of years to process around the sky. Um, there's obviously an enormous difference in the energies involved in the two types of uh, phenomena. However, clearly studying SS-433 must be telling us something about the nature of jets and quasars and radio galaxies. Indeed, I would liken it to, if one was principally uh, interested in the study of elephants, if you could get an ant and put it under the microscope, then at least that tells you something about living things, which you can then apply to your study of elephants. And one can liken the radio galaxies and quasars to astronomical elephants, and SS-433 is an astronomical ant. It was a highly interesting ant. David, you've been involved in this research right from the very start. What next? Well, I think astronomers are continuing to monitor SS-433 from ground-based telescopes. For many of us now, SS-433 is like an old friend. And when we get to a telescope and we've got 10 minutes to spare in our observing program, we'll have a quick look at it. Um, I think that the major advances are likely to come when next we get into space with X-ray telescopes. Uh, next year, the Japanese are to launch a X-ray observatory called Astro C, and that will enable us to look at the variability in X-rays. To really improve on that X-ray image I showed you earlier from Einstein, we will have to wait for the next generation of big X-ray observatories probably uh, in the mid to late 90s. Well, meanwhile, the work goes on. Finally, David, let's speculate for a moment. I say SS-433 is 15,000 light years away. What would it look like from close range? Anything like this, do you think, in this lovely drawing by Paul Doherty? Well, Patrick, I think if you and I could get there, it might look something rather like that. I think what we would see is the giant companion star with material being stripped from it swirling down onto the surface of a neutron star via that swirling accretion disk and some of the material being ejected in those finely collimated jets as shown there. Well, it's a fascinating thought. Well, thank you very much, David, and uh, we hope to learn a great deal more from SS-433 in the future. It's one of the most bizarre objects known. It's already told us a lot, and I'm sure it's going to tell us a great deal more within the next few years. And so for the moment, from David and myself, and SS-433. Good night.